Hello, I'm Zach Helmberger, and I am going to give this another try. Um, I was reading 1 John 4, 7, and, and I wanted to dig in a little deeper to find out what is, you know, this because it says uh, something about born from God. So here's, uh, here's the screen here. I'm going to do a screen share. And uh, hopefully you don't see that weird flickering that I do. Um, but there's uh, 1 John 4, 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born, has been born of God and knows God. Um, so I went into the uh, interlinear for 1 John 4, 7. And, of course, uh, beloved, and, and you can see it's uh, agape toy. So it's the root is agape, which is, you know, agape love, which is, uh, you know, selfless or altruistic love. And then you come down here and it says, um, uh, every and everyone loving, uh, from God has from God has been born and knows God, and here's the word that I was uh, focusing on was was uh, get get or something like that, and that is Strong's uh, Greek one zero eight zero, and so I looked at this, and um. It was quite the deal. Um, of course, it means you know to beget, to bring forth. Is and it's usually in, in the male sense, uh, the man begets. Uh, you know, so it's like you know Adam begat. You know, so like in you know in Genesis, you got begat, 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 and uh, so you have you have the same thing here in. Uh, uh, Matthew, you got uh, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac uh, begat Jacob, you know, so you got the begat, 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 begats, going all the way down the list here of the instances of that word. Okay, so um, now there's this thing called Theos Greek lexicon, which um, goes into a little more detail. And of course, you know, properly of men begetting children. Okay, cool. And it can also mean, you know, um, uh, more rarely women giving birth to children, but primarily it's, it's men begetting uh, children. Okay, so there's a bunch of examples and minutia on that. Then part two of this definition, it says metaphorically, uh, and then you know, to engender, to cause, to arise, to excite. Um, and then part B here, in a Jewish sense, and remember, these are all, you know, I mean, John, the Apostle John is a Jew, uh, James is a Jew, Peter's, you know, I mean, they're all, you know, and Jesus, of course, you know, they're all Jews um, in uh, Judea. So, so this would be totally appropriate uh, to mention this. So it says, in a Jewish sense, of one who brings others over to his way of life. And remember what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, so, you know, there's a way in life. So, so there's a, um, and Paul even in his confession to uh, the King Agrippa or something like that, uh, that he confessed that he was a follower of the way and that um and that he you know followed you know the way as found in like you know the torah and the prophets and the psalms or the writings or something like that so um so um so it says in a jewish sense one who brings others over to his way of life and i thought that was pretty interesting and then um then there's this part here um that just blew my mind 
it, it's something from Sanhedrin folio 19 something something. Uh, I don't know what that is exactly, but it says, if one teaches the son of his neighbor the law, so, so if one teaches the son of his neighbor the Torah, the scripture, you know, uh, the scripture reckons this as the same as though he had begotten him. So um, when you uh, bring someone over to the Torah, is that it's as if you have begotten him in the name of Jesus or in the name of God, you know, in the name of Jehovah. And um, yeah, so that was uh, quite the deal when I read that. Um, I think that was pretty much everything. Uh, it says here, peculiarly in the gospel in the first epistle of John of God conferring upon men the nature and disposition of his sons, okay? So uh, imparting to them spiritual life by his own holy power, prompting and persuading souls to put faith in Christ and live a new life consecrated to him, absolutely. Um, and so this, this kind of hints at uh, um, uh, baptism. So I'll get into that later. So that was pretty cool. Um, then I looked at the instant, all the instances of uh, Greek word uh, 1080, which is geneo, which is that beget business. And so I was looking through all the ones that, that were talking about that metaphorical sense of, of begetting um, and not the literal sense of you know, begetting you know, physical children in the physical realm. So the first one that I come across is John 1.13. It says, you know, who were born not of blood. Or a, okay, so, so we go and look at that one. And so here it is. This is um, um, John 1, chapter 1, uh, verse, I'll start with verse 12. But to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God children born not of blood, nor of the desire or will of man, but born of God. And then the word became flesh, and it's talking about Jesus, and and um, could also you know, say it's like the Torah became flesh, uh, another possible way to look at that, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's uh, some interesting tidbits there. So the next uh, instance was in John chapter 3, the famous passage where Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night um, under, the, you know, under the cover of dark to um, inquire of him. So it says, he came to Jesus that night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And then Jesus replied, truly, truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So I went into the... Um, the interlinear on this one. So let's go back up here. This is biblehub.com, by the way. It's a pretty nice website, uh, biblehub.com. So I click on the interlinear and it shows, uh, answered Jesus, said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, if not anyone born from above, not he is able to see the kingdom of God. So, um, so being born again, I mean, it kind of makes sense, um, or born from above. So this means uh, you, have, you have to be born from above, um, you know, or begotten from above. And so again, it's going back to the, um, 
uh, going back to the lexicon there for the Greek 1080 uh, Geneo, it says in a Jewish sense of one who brings others, brings others over to his way of life. Um, and then it's like, if one teaches the son of his neighbor, the Torah, the scripture reckons this as the same as though he had begotten him. Okay. Um, and then, so this, the word here, so you have a uh, genethe and then anothen. So again, this is the, the Greek uh, 1080 and then there's uh, Greek 509, anothen, which can sometimes mean um, again or born anew, okay? The, which is what most translations say. Um, you know, like, you know, KJV, you know, King James, they'll say again, you know, you must be born again, or, or you must be born anew. Um, but it's also uh, from, from above, or as it says, from heaven, uh, which is, yeah, more, uh, you know. So, and John 331 uses this word, uh, 509, anothen, in uh, verse 31 of that same chapter. And it says, the one who comes from above is above all. And then da, 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 and that says, the one who comes from heaven is above all. So you can kind of see that it's almost like it's suggesting that, that from above is the same as from heaven. So it's, it's suggesting that it's, you know, it's from above and not like anew or again. Because um, the, the one who comes, I mean, you could say the one who comes again is above all. And, and you could kind of make that interpretation because Jesus is coming again. So anyway, I thought that was uh, interesting. Um, and then um, there were some examples uh, so, you know, some more examples in, and by the way, um, where's John 3.3, 3? is that this one? Uh, let's see here, I'm going to go back. Okay, uh, John 3.3, 3, um, you know, truly, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Interestingly, it had a uh, cross-reference to Ezekiel 36. So um, I thought I'd uh, read, read that. It was kind of an interesting passage. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 24. Ezekiel 36, starting with verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you back into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. Um, then you will live in the land that I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so there seems to be, you know, something, you know, circling around, you know, ordinances, the law, my, you know, my statutes, and things like this. Okay, and then another example is, um, so now we're going to jump into 1 John, because there's another example of that, Janeo, um, 1 John 2.29. Okay. And, and now, little children, remain in Christ so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. 
if you know that he is righteous, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness, so it's an intentional, you know, you're practicing righteousness. You have to learn what righteousness is and then actually practice it. Um, so it says, you also know that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And again, that's Janeo, um, G1080. Okay, another example is 1 John 3, 9. Uh, 1 John 3, 9. And let's see. Okay, so starting with verse 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the very start. This is why the Son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. So there's people who practice sin. So practicing sin is it's an intentional practice. You know, you're working at it. You know, you're um, it's like your way of life is to is to sin. Now, verse nine says, anyone born of God refuses to practice sin because God's seed abides in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. And in verse 10, by this, the children of God are distinguished from the children of the devil. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. So there's something there's something that we need to practice. And um, otherwise we're not born of God. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is, um, yeah, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. And then um, this is a, a quick aside. I mean, going back to, um, um, 1 John 4, 7, which where I originally started this uh, remarkable rabbit trail. Uh, it says, Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So, uh, and I think that probably, you know, leads us right back to, I think it was 1 John 3, 6 that we were reading. Um, One John three six. I'll start with verse five. But you know that Christ appeared to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who remains in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen Him, or has known Him. So I thought that was an interesting uh, connection. Then also there's 1 John 2, 3. I'll start with verse 2. 1 John 2, verse 2. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this, we can be sure that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. If anyone, verse four, if anyone says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, he is a liar and the truth, the truth is not in him. Okay. And so again, so we're getting this, this connections. We've got truth, um, commandments, Knowing him, um, you know, so there's a lot of this. It, it's fascinating stuff. I and mean, when you really start to get into this, is it's making some interesting connections. Um, then there's another word that's um, kind of a what is it? A compound word. It's kind of like two words together. 
And that one is uh, anageneo, which is to literally be born again. So ana, I guess, means again. So again born or, or again beget. And that is the first instance of that word is 1 Peter 1. Okay, and verse 3. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and un unfading, reserved in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power for the salvation that is ready to be re to be revealed in the last time. So, um, so he's given us a new birth. So, and that's that anageneo word. And then, in that same chapter, in verse twenty-three, it says, uh, "Maybe I'll back up a little bit." Okay, I'll start with 22, verse 22, 1 Peter 1, verse 22. Since you have purified your souls by obedience to the truth, what could that be? What could obedience to the truth mean? So that you have a genuine love for your brothers, love one another deeply from a pure heart, for you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And then he quotes, I think that's uh, Isaiah 40, verses six through eight, Isaiah 40. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of Jehovah stands forever. And this is the word that was proclaimed to you. And this is the word that was euangelion uh, or whatever, uh, the gospel. That's the word that they use for the gospel. And this word, and this is the word that was gospeled to you, uh, is another way to put it. Um, we'll just look at that real quick. Um, Interlinear, uh, 1 Peter one twenty five. Uh, you angelus then, so that's uh, haven't been proclaimed to you. So the word, you angelus then to you, and to announce good news. That's you know, um, bring good news, preach good tidings with a you know. Um, good news, and so the full gospel of Christ this, uh, refers to sharing the full gospel of Christ, literally gospelizing that announces the complete message of the good news. So this is, uh, you know, it's pretty cool. Anyway. That's a whole nother, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to go there. That's like a whole nother amazing teaching. Um, okay, so that was Anna Janeo. Then, whoops. Oh, yeah, like that, okay. Um, and then there's another example. Uh, it's using a different word. I, I can't remember what that... Greek word is, but that's going to take us to James 118. So if you go to um, James, whoops, 118. Okay. I'll start with verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Ah, interesting. I wonder if that might, I'm, I got to check that. That's too cool. 
uh, verse 17, interlinear from above. Anothen, 509, that's exact same. So this is the exact same word that they used in um, when Jesus said, you must be born again, or it must be born from above. Interesting. Okay, so anyway, let's get back to the uh, what we were originally focusing on. Verse 17, James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, with whom there is no change or shifting shadow. Now verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creation. And that's another interesting word, first fruits uh, is mentioned in the Torah. It's a, 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 a very important day. Actually, there's two times where you know, first fruits is um, used. So anyway, um, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. So that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creation. And then verse 19, my beloved brothers, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So anyway, um, and so that takes us back to uh, 1 John one John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Um, that he, so going back to James 1, 18, said he chose to give us birth through the word of truth. It would be kind of a first fruits. And there's a whole bunch of verses in you know, especially like Psalm 119. If you ever read Psalm 119 and look up and, and then search, do a text search in Psalm 119, Psalm, Psalm 119 for the word truth or the word true. And I think you'd be quite surprised by what you find there. Okay, then uh, we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. There's a passage there. Um, one C O R one Corinthians chapter four. Okay, we're gonna go to fourteen. First Corinthians chapter four, starting with verse fourteen. I am not writing this to shame you, but to warn you, as my beloved children. So there it is. Uh, my beloved children. That's interesting. Yeah, so I forgot to preface this. This uh, we're getting into this section. Um, we're getting into this section with examples of how the apostles are actually doing. Because what is said in, in the definition of Janeo, in a, in a Jewish sense, is um, you know if you bring someone over to your way of life, that it's as if you had begotten them, so if you become their father. Um, and that's what, uh, yeah, so there's uh, 1 John 3, 7. I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, 1 John 3, 7. Uh, so I, I skipped over that one. Okay. I'll start with verse six. No one who remains in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen him or known him. Again, there's that word no. Verse seven, little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices, the one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as Messiah Christ is righteous. Um, so that the little part here about little children. So it's, it's addressing, so it's almost like he's a, a father addressing his little children. And they are in the process of growing in, in 
Um, see, sanctification is a process. It's not like, oh, I'm born again. It's like, well, it's not, it's a process. It, and um, it's, you know, you need to learn the word of God. You need to learn what pleases God, what displeases God and, and conform your life to that, uh, to his truth. And so it's, and that's sanctification. You're sanctifying yourself to, you know, to walk even as Jesus walked, to be imitators of Christ. And, and you'll see that sometimes, you know, you know uh, I think it was, it was Paul that says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So um, that's kind of what this whole process is about. So it's like, you know, being born again is not some feeling or, oh, you know, like uh, an emotion or something. I'm born again. It's, it's, it's a bit more involved than just that. Um, okay, then we're going to go back to uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 4.14. 4, I am not writing you to shame you, but to warn you as my beloved children. Even if you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Okay, so let's look down uh, again, uh, verse 15. And I think it's like, uh, N, you know, NKJV, New King James. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ. So this is the whole part about teaching, you know, getting to know the word, the law of God, you know, God's instructions for us for living a, a, a good, right, and just life on earth. Um, there's instructions, and that's part of this begetting process of, of becoming a child of God, is to learn of his ways and to walk in them. You know, first you have to kind of crawl and stumble and, and get up and walk on two feet, and then, you know, then you can start to, you know, walk briskly and then run, it's like you're running the race, you know. Uh, so, 1 Corinthians 4, 15, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. And that's, again, that's the, um, we'll go to the inner linear just to, just to prove it. Um, I, you have begotten, again, Greek Strong's 1080, and that's a variation of, of Janeo. So it says, I have begotten you through the gospel. Okay. So then there was a question as well, is the gospel distinct from the Torah? Is, is the Torah and the gospel are they one and the same? Or is it, you know, something, you know, is the gospel, the Torah plus something? You know, there's some interesting uh, questions. So I mean, there's just oh, I mean, there's just no end to the fascinating lines of inquiry into this. Okay, another example of apostles begetting children. It's evidence for it, and this is probably one of the one of the stronger pieces that we just read here. Let's go to uh, what's this? So it's uh, Luke, I am your father. Oh, okay, I, I, okay, that must be something else. Um, 1 Corinthians 9, 1. Okay, so I'm going to go to Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Um, okay, let's go to parallel. All right. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthians. And in chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you yourselves not my workmanship in the Lord? And so this is, so this is, a, again, it's it, it not directly, you know, using the word geneo, but he's talking about my workmanship in the Lord. So, it's, you know, so when the, the apostle or a teacher 
I mean, they're laboring uh, to bring you closer and closer to the word of God, to, uh, to um, you know, the, in this process of sanctification. Um, so, okay, so the next one is uh, Galatians 4.19. Let's see if I can uh, pull that one up. Um, Galatians, whoops. Um, let's see here. My children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is fully formed in you. So there's, you can see there's this process. This is, you know, and, and it's a learning process. You're learning God's way, you're learning what his instructions are to live a, you know, a good, right, and just life that honors him, that shows your love for him, that shows your gratitude for him. And uh, that, because it says in um, 1 John, this is love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. And So again, you know, so my children for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is fully formed in you. And this is the, you know, the path, this is the way, the, the walk, you know, it, it's a journey. So born again is not some sudden thing that just happens. Oh, I'm born again. It's a process, it's a journey. Okay, three John. One. I'll start with verse three. I want to focus on verse four, but I'll start with verse three. Three John, third John, chapter one, verse three. For I was overjoyed when the brothers came and testified about your devotion to the truth in which you continue to walk I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's pretty cool. That's so. So you can see that John, the, the apostle John, is begetting children of God. He's teaching them the truth found in the word of God. And they are walking in it. And that fills him with joy, just like any father would be filled with joy at his children learning from him and walking in his ways. And first, next example is uh, First Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, you are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless our conduct was among you. And I believe this is Paul speaking to people at Thessalonica, Greece. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless our conduct was among you who believed. For you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children, encouraging you comforting you and urging you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Then um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. I'm just going to read these off because I, I have it printed out here. It says, uh, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and Messiah Jesus our Lord. Second Timothy, chapter one, verse two. Uh, so he's addressing Timothy. And to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace 
from God the Father and Messiah Jesus, our Lord. And then there's this one uh, that was really cool is uh, Philemon 110. Whoops. Okay. I, I guess I'm Ph Philemon 1. No? Okay. Uh, by Lemon. By Lemon. Okay, and we, we want to go to verse 10. By Lemon 1, verse 10. Okay. Verse, I'll start with verse 9. I prefer to appeal on the basis of love, for I, Paul, am now aged and a prisoner of Christ Jesus as well. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whose father I became while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Interesting. Let's look at uh, New King James. Uh, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. And just to confirm, we'll look at the interlinear I have begotten. And, and Genesa, again, Greek Strong's 1080. So there's this, this thing of, of, of people so basically, you can beget children um, uh, for God, even if you know you're you know a husband and wife, and, and you can't have physical children. You can beget children for God by teaching them of His ways, His ways, and and uh, you know having them walk in those ways. And actually, that kind of just as a, a reminder, I thought I'd read it again. Ezekiel 36 says, For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries, and I will bring you back into your own land. This is talking about a time, you see, it was you know, the, the creation of the state of Israel. But Ezekiel is not talking about that. This is a future event. This is going to be what's called the, the greater Exodus or the second Exodus. We original Exodus, Moses led the people. But and he, did, he didn't he didn't just lead the Jews, but all Israel, all 12 tribes of, of Israel. He led the Israelites and a mixed multitude of Egyptians and people from other nations. People who are in Egypt at the time, he says, well, I'm following this God. You know, they, you know, the heck with the Egyptians. I'm following this God. You know, so they went and followed with Moses, and they became as one. This is those who, who follow my ways, whether they're native-born Israelites or foreigners or whatever, they are all, they, you shall treat them as native-born, which is super awesome. And in revolution, I mean, no other religion or government or you know, no other thing was, was had a, a, um, a concept like that. And so this is, this Ezekiel 36, this is for us. And it says, for I will take you, I'll take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and I will bring you back into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and will, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities. Again, there's this sanctification, notion of sanctification. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. Mm. 
Okay. So then there's the, uh, getting back to way back at the beginning of this, I was talking about baptism. There's, there's, uh, there's some hints. Uh, there were some things that were hinting at uh, baptism that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read 11 through 15. Um, my brothers, some of you from Chilo's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this, individuals among you are saying, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized into my name. And this is Paul talking. So he's, you know, he's saying, I did not baptize anybody in my name. So there it would imply that there are instances where people are being baptized into the name of, you know, such and such. And, and that the whole thing, when you go back to the definition of Janeo, uh, Janeo, uh, Greek 1080, metaphorically, um, in a Jewish sense, to bring others over to his way of life. If, and again, if one teaches the son of his neighbors the law, the Torah, scripture reckons it's the same as though he had begotten him. And, um, and then peculiarly in the gospel in the first epistle of John, of God conferring upon man the nature and dispositions of his sons, imparting them spiritual life by his holy power, prompting and persuading souls to put faith in Christ and live a new life consecrated to him. Okay. And, uh, and then I throw in Acts, the book of Acts chapter two, verse 38, I'll just read this one off of the printout here. It says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so then I got to thinking, okay, well, is there any place, you know, that talks about this uh, baptism business? And I found this a really cool website that talks about baptism in rabbinical Judaism, which is based on the Bible, but it, um, it rabbinical Judaism, this is kind of a, an aside, although rabbinical Judaism is based on the Bible, it, it violates the Bible by adding to and taking away from the word of God. And, you know, the various, you know, mainstream uh, Christianity, you know, Christian churches, you know, denominations do the same thing. They add to and take away from God's, the word of God, and thus break, you know, breaking his word. Because, um, you know, the word of God, is, it's whole, it's complete, it's, you know, it's, um, so the website is myjewishlearning.com, and it's an article about uh, why immerse in the mikvah? Mikvah is you know immersing yourself in a special kind of bathtub called a mikvah, and that this is like a super important part of of uh, rabbinical Judaism. So here says um, no other religious act is so freighted with the meaning as this one, which touches every aspect of life and proclaims a total commitment to a new idea and a new way of life as it swallows up the old as you immerse 
into the water, it swallows up the old and gives birth to the new. The water of the mikvah is designed to ritually cleanse a person from beads of the path. The convert is considered by Jewish law, this is man-made law, not divine law necessarily, but by Jewish law to be like a newborn child. So this is um, uh, really cool. And so I, I thought I would conclude with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, there's a verse in there that I think is really cool. Brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. And again, this is that same Apollo. So, you know, whether it's saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow um, Cephas, or I follow Christ uh, earlier in chapter one of First Corinthians. Um, okay, I'll start with verse five. First Corinthians chapter four, verse five. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Brothers, I have, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over another for who makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Um, but the key is, you know, Paul was teaching the people not to go beyond what is written. And what is written, you know, again, it's just like what, you know, when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, um, you know, turn these stones into bread. And it says, it is written, man should not live by bread alone. He's, you know, so Jesus is quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting from like Deuteronomy or, or, you know, one of the things in the Torah. Um, do not go beyond what is written. So I'm almost 100% sure that, you know, that is what he's talking about. He's talking about, you know, the written, the scripture, because all they had at that time when, when Paul was doing this, they had the, you know, Genesis through Malachi, you know, they had the Torah, the prophets, the Psalms, you know, and, and the writings, stuff like that. That's what they had at that time. And it was a, um, in most cases, it was a Greek translation of Genesis through Malachi, and which is called the Septuagint. So a lot of, you'll see a lot of these, when the people quote here, they're, they're usually quoting from the Septuagint in the New Testament. So anyway, um, I thought that was really cool. And so you, you really get a sense of what it actually is to be born again. And that people are begetting children of God by bringing them over to his way. They're bringing people over to his way. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but me. And then in um, uh, John 14, um, is this wonderful, wonderful passage. You know, so, so he says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And, and then, uh, so anyway, so Philip says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus replied, Philip, have I been with you all this time, and you still do not know me? Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And here's the kicker. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own. Instead, it is the Father dwelling in me, performing his works. 
believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the account of the works himself. Then um, it says 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. And again, you know, read Psalm 119 and do a, a search the text. You know, it's like on biblehub.com or something like that. Pull up Psalm 119 and then, you know, do like control F or do a text search for the word truth or true. And, and, you, and you'll see all kinds of, I mean, it's pretty mind blowing. Um, so the father, he will, let's see, I, uh, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot receive him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you do know him for he abides with you and will be in you. That's a really, you know, that, that one little word in, I mean, it, it's really important. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip ahead to verse 21 here. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, so this is that walk, you know, you, you walk in his ways, you keep his commandments and his instructions. It says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Notice that does not say, whoever has my commandments and keep them is the one who is saved. That's not what it's saying. There's all this whole weird thing going around it. You know, people who, you know, say, hey, you know, I think I should be obeying the Torah. Well, you know, you know you're trying to do the works of the law in order to be saved. It's like, no. It says right here, crystal clear, the Lord Jesus himself is saying, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. This is about love. This is not about trying to, you know, be high and mighty or, you know, saving yourself by keeping the Torah perfectly, which of course nobody can do perfectly except him. Um, then it says, the one who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and reveal myself to him. And then uh, verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Again, it's the same. My father will love him and he will come to him and make, and, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. The word that you hear is not my own, but it is from the father who sent me. So this is, you know, so you see that there's this, you know, it's the I and the Father are one. You know, there's, they're, um, they're one and the same. Whatever the Father says is what Jesus says, and whatever Jesus says is what the Father says. And so um, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. You know, this is what Jesus says. So my word, what, well, what word is this? You know, is, is, does Jesus have a set of instructions that's somehow distinct from the Father? Um, you know, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So if Jesus gave any instructions or commands that were not from the Father, then he would not be the sinless, you know, the spotless lamb of God, because that, because sin is to teach others to not obey God's instructions, to, or to, or to obey an instruction that's not found in God's law. You know, and, it, you know, and you get, you know, and there's passages where it says, a new commandment I give you, love one another, you know. Well, if you look at, you know, Leviticus 19, it says, you know, do not, um, um, you know, do not seek revenge or do not bear a grudge with, with your neighbor, but love your neighbor as your very self. You know, so love your neighbor. So I mean, there it is. So Jesus is expanding upon and, and teaching and exemplifying 
that instruction, you know, when he says, you know, and I think he was kind of being tongue in cheek when he says a new commandment. But I think he was, you know, he was adding an extra, I mean, you know, raising the bar. On it. He's saying, um, I can't remember exactly how it went, but it says a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So he's raising the bar. I mean, you know, Jesus, Jesus' love for us is just, you know, it just makes your head explode. I mean, it's just, it's just so, you just can't take it in. It's like, how could, how could Jesus love me this much? And um, so it's new in the sense that he raised the bar on it, but he didn't fundamentally change the command. He said, you know, love your neighbor. You know, love your neighbor, but love him as, as I, even as I have, have loved you. So anyway, hope that uh, uh, shed some light. Uh, may the Lord uh, richly bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and may he lift up his countenance to you and give you shalom in Yeshua's name. Amen.